Okay, hello everybody. Thanks again for your patience as we start um, using Zoom for our SAN coordinator calls. Uh, this is the January uh, SAN coordinator call. And uh, we have quite a full agenda here of good information uh, to share about upcoming events and um, an update on negotiated rulemaking. So without further ado, I wanna move right into um, the NASAPS conference agenda. You'll see on the agenda that item number two is the conference agenda. And uh, I wanna share that with you because they have just opened the registration and we had quite a few of our SAN members um, submit proposals. I would say probably 80% or so of those that submitted the proposals were chosen by NASAPS um, to provide their presentation. And those that weren't, I understand that NASAPS will be working with them to provide um, some webcasts on the very good topics that they brought forward. But it just was amazing to them, frankly, that uh, we had so many good proposals this year. It was a record number, they said. So I was very excited about that. So as you look at the agenda, what you'll see is um, we have uh, the most important thing I think to focus on for SAN is looking at the Tuesday morning. And what you'll see there is a slate of SAN related topic items. On the first day, which is a Monday, is the concurrent session, excuse me, the um, general session day where we have uh, a wonderful um, variety of things in regard to uh, interactions with Sarah by higher ed regulatory agencies, NSPE, and the institutions, uh, learning about uh, what's going on in Washington from uh, our friends at Thompson Coburn. And so these are uh, sessions that we will be able to learn with regulators. And then the next day in the morning is a SAN focused morning where we will have a SAN breakfast and we have a number of uh, sessions starting with our friends from James Madison University who will be providing a compliance checklist that they have cultivated and work with colleagues. And we will also have um, our next session will be on communication strategies from our friends at Ohio State University and then uh, we'll conclude the morning with uh, talking about NC Sarah reporting, being able to look at it from the viewpoint of a small institution and from a large institution, because we'll have our colleagues at Texas Women's University and Penn State University providing that session. After lunch, our colleagues from Embry-Riddle will be providing a session on creating a culture of compliance. And then we will have, at the end of the day, an hour and a half about professional licensure research from three different institutions' perspectives, from our friends at WGU, Northern State University, and University of Phoenix. I'm very pleased that these will uh, be available to you. Then Wednesday morning is the end of the conference, and uh, back by popular demand, information about international compliance for online programs. So we're very pleased that uh, Greg Fahrenbach from Hogan Levels is willing to come back and do a part two. Uh, we will have an NC Sarah update, which will include a variety of things, including uh, where we are. We, we should have the guide uh, live by then, so to show everyone how to operate and use the guide. And then we'll conclude on Wednesday with uh, an update from Russ Poulin about uh, the ne negotiated rulemaking for 2019. You'll recall that negotiated rulemaking just started last week. So by April, we should have some pretty, pretty good information about how this will all move forward. So you'll see that the registration option is right there, the link there. This is open to all staff members, not just coordinators. So you can share this information with others at your institutions. And the registration code for SAM members is that um, eight digit uh, code that you'll see there. And uh, so you can share that with your um, your other institution contacts or your other membership contacts if you're from a larger membership. So please share that coordinator code, or excuse me, that registration code with other SAN members so that they can register for the conference. It'll be in Jacksonville and that's in mid-April. And we really look forward to that. If you have any questions about that, please don't hesitate to contact me um, just for those who aren't familiar with it. What we have here is the opportunity annually um, NASAPS is very um, gracious in allowing us to help coordinate the agenda and allowing us to attend as the member rate. 
And so this is something that we've been able to do for a few years now and uh, have appreciated their willingness to uh, collaborate with us on this very productive conference each spring. So um, we'll, uh, I will let you all um, move on to the agenda because uh, we have Russ and Mary Ann here and I'm here as well. We're attending the CCME conference right now. So we have another session that we need to get to. So it's important that we um, move through this first half of the agenda. So I wanna turn it over to Russ who is gonna be able to share with us about uh, negotiated rulemaking and suggested principles for addressing issues that you may have seen as the blog post from about a week ago. So I'm gonna turn it over to Russ now. Russ? Uh, Dave's gonna be next. Dave's gonna be next, okay, all right. I'm assuming the chair of power here, so. Hello everyone, uh, I, as you may recall with the negotiated rulemaking that there's uh, uh, quite a number of issues that the Department of Ed Education is interested in uh, uh, reviewing and making uh, changes on uh, around accreditation and, and innovation. Uh, we have, we'll have Dave Dandenberg on in a bit. They'll talk about the main committee, but I'm uh, on, a, on a subcommittee uh, that is focused on uh, distance learning and uh, education innovation issues. Uh, for While there's uh, quite a number of issues that probably that we'd want to talk about for the purposes of this SAN call, I'm going to focus on the uh, state authorization uh, discussion. Dave may want to um, uh, talk about some of the some of the others, but uh, uh, for state authorization, that there uh, were suggested changes that were put out um, in paper form uh, prior to our meeting. That and, and in that, that they were going, they were suggesting uh, uh, getting rid of uh, all of the uh, language that was introduced, uh, the federal language that was introduced in uh, 2016 and was supposed to have gone into effect in uh, July of 2018, but had been delayed, uh, that they had suggested uh, de de deleting all that. And so that was interesting. Um, when I spoke, I did uh, remind everyone that, uh, that even if you got rid of the federal rule, that the states still have their rules, and we've been uh, constant in letting people know, know that and remind them of that because it's often uh, portrayed that um, if you get rid of the federal rule, then institutions won't have to do anything with any of the states, and that's just not the case. After uh, considerable discussion about the issues and the thoughts of those around the uh, table and, uh, the, and just a bit about those who are there that they represent uh, uh, you know, consumer protection folks, different types of uh, institutions, those who are doing uh, competency-based education. We have somebody from Attorney's General Office. We have somebody from the State Higher Education Executive Officers uh, is there. Uh, so it's, it was uh, quite a few, quite a different, a few different uh, um, constituencies were represented. And uh, after some discussion that the Department of Education said that they had discussed it and that they do indeed uh, think that they would like to uh, reinstate some of that language and we're looking for committee members to uh, propose what would be appropriate in terms of federal state authorization uh, language. And it seemed like there were, um, uh, and we didn't get too deep into that discussion other than that they would like to see language at our next meeting. Uh, so the first part of it is, is that they would continue to uh, tie uh, eligibility for federal financial aid uh, to being approved in a state where you're serving students. Uh, and then the second was around uh, some of the notifications uh, that were in the last, last one and, and some of which actually were in the uh, uh, older versions of the, uh, of the rule that especially uh, the department seemed to be taken, uh, taken by the uh, discussions about uh, notifications of professional licensure that there have been uh, it's really a high stakes uh, area for students and that students should know whether um, the program will lead to licensure um, if they're taking it at a distance if it'll lead if it will uh, meet the academic requirements for licensure within their uh, within their state there's also some talk about uh, complaints and adverse actions being part of the notifications but we really didn't get uh, that deep, that deep into that. A uh, second big part of discussion there uh, had to do with the definition of reciprocity and a reciprocity uh, agreement uh, uh, agency to to run those. Uh, as you may recall, that there's a few years ago when it 
came out in 2016, there was great confusion about the language that uh, the department included. It made it look like you could have reciprocity as long as every state could enforce whatever rule or law that it had, which of course, if you uh, did that, that uh, it would mean that you didn't really have reciprocity because uh, going back to every state doing whatever it wanted to would uh, put us back to the initial state prior to reciprocity. Uh, so we do have a couple of the members who are um, advocating that position that states should, even if they're in a reciprocity, that they should be able to um, uh, enforce uh, rules like refund policies and should be able to uh, treat institutions of different types differently should they choose. Um, and so that they're, they're talking, talking about that. I think uh, uh, there also were a number of members who pointed out that the, how that would uh, harm reciprocity. So at this point, um, it was a lot of general discussion. Uh, there was agreement to try to move forward with uh, uh, working on, on some language, although no one was really uh, appointed, but I'm certainly gonna try to go to the front and try to uh, look at some of the old language from uh, 2010 and 2014 and 2016 and do some, uh, uh, recommenda get some recommendations uh, um, uh, from that language and look at that language and also I'm uh, interested in getting uh, input either on this call or after this call if you want to send emails about what you would like to see or not see in that language would certainly like to like to hear from you and so uh, that's a, a, a brief update and so we would like to turn it to Dan or, or turn it to uh, Dave or I'm gonna unmute questions. Dan uh, so, Dan, are you there? Can you unmute yourself, Dan? Can you see? Yeah, I'm here. Yep. Super. So, uh, I'm a little challenged today because we have just the one screen. I have my little laptop that I'm doing this on today. But I asked Dan if he wouldn't mind keeping an eye on the chat to see if you all have any questions for us. I don't see anything so far. Okay. Well, why don't we turn to Dave, Dave Dannenberg, University of Alaska, Anchorage, if I, if I could uh, introduce him. Uh, he's A, a great guy, and B, he's on the uh, uh, WCT steering committee, and C, that uh, he's on, remember I was on the subcommittee that's making recommendations, and we're making recommendations to the main committee, uh, which will make the decisions on this, and Dave is on that. And so, Dave, let me turn this to you and see what sort of comments that, that uh, uh, you have about the, uh, the meetings that you had. Okay. Oh, there he is. Hi, Dave. Good Thank morning. You. Dave. Thank you, Russ, for those kind words. I think you're a great guy, too. So. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so, hello, everybody. Uh, I am David Dannenberg up here at the University of Alaska Anchorage by introduction um, and I serve or I am serving on the main accreditation and innovation committee um, as the representative for four-year public inst the primary negotiator for four-year public institutions um, it's kind of a daunting task thinking that I'm speaking on behalf of all four-year um, public institutions. So if you fall in that category, um, if at any point in time today or over the next few months you have thoughts, comments, concerns, please let me know because I would love to be able to um, bring those to the table as we move through the negotiation process. Um, as already mentioned, it did start last week. Um, our main committee meetings were supposed to be on Monday, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, however, as those of you that sort of live in the DC area or out on the East Coast um, side, you had a little bit of a snowstorm. Um, so our, uh, our negotiations were actually delayed by a day and a half. Um, so instead of starting Monday morning, they did not start till noon on Tuesday. Um, it is still unclear <clears throat> what that will do to our timeline. We did have conversation around that. Um, the department is hoping that um, we can make up the time as we move through the issues. Um, so I think that's even more ambitious than 
tackling the number of issues we already have in front of us. Um, so we will be discussing probably at February's meeting what we'll be doing moving forward with the time. Um, the the main part of the, the, the really the main function of the, the the main committee in this first meeting was to get our legs under us. So out of the day and a half, um, rather than actually speaking about all the issues as the subcommittees that were able to meet the following days after ours meeting, um, were able to sort of jump into a lot of their work. We spent out of the first day and a half, um, we spent about seven hours, I guess, so that's almost a full day, just doing all the um, formal uh, practices that have to go in place to begin the negotiations. So the, the introduction of, of the negotiators, um, of which there are, um, and we just added one. So I think we're at 16 um, primary negotiators. The primary negotiators are the ones that do officially vote for consensus on issues. And then there is a secondary negotiator um, who is allowed to speak, but is a non-voting um, member of, of the committee. Uh, and those 16 members represent, just as you have constituencies in, um, as Russ mentioned, we also have the sort of same look at a broader perspective on the main committee. So we have the four-year schools, two-year schools, those that engage in uh, predominantly distance education. We have the state higher education authority. We, ha we do not have an attorney general uh, representative on our meeting, or on our committee, uh, but we do have a couple of um, consumer advocacy groups from the statewide level. We have students. We have two or three accreditation um, agencies representing different um, segments of the higher education community. So it is a, a broad group um, of folks discussing these issues. Um, we also had to agree on the protocols, so the formal sort of rules that we will all abide by. Um, then we had to set the agenda, agree on the issues that would be discussed. Um, and so there was a lot of formalities that went in. I was kind of amazed at that part. Um, a lot of formalities had to go in. Like I said, it was about seven hours. So it took us through all of our first half day and then halfway through the morning of our second day. Um, so by the time our committee started uh, really discussing the issues at hand, um, it was about 11 o'clock on Wednesday morning. Um, and we broke for lunch. Sorry for the background noise. There's a helicopter across the street at the hospital if uh, that's bothering anybody. Um, so we jumped into initially just talking about accreditation. Um, as Russ mentioned, the department did prepare proposed language um, for us to start reviewing. Um, this is, as they kept saying, this is their sort of starting point. Um, and they were open for suggestions um, and really looking for some agreement and direction on proposed languages. Um, because there are three subcommittees, it's still a little unclear to the main committee when exactly we'll be talking about different issues because the Department of Education was very clear that said that anything that they have referred to a subcommittee um, of which there are three representing religious based institutions, um, the Teach uh, Grant Act folks, and then the committee Russ is on. Anything discussed in those committees will not be discussed in the main committee until the subcommittees have completed their work and bring language or proposals or information forward. Um, so uh, timing wise, we're still all a little uncertain of when we'll be talking about what topics, um, but we did start with um, uh, section 602, which covers the accreditation and who and what it goes into being an accreditation agency. Um, and we only got, honestly, through five or six sections based on the discussion. So um, like I'm happy to take 
take questions or concerns, but honestly, and because we missed that day and a half, there honestly wasn't a whole lot of discussion of the actual issues in the main committee at this first meeting. Thank you very much for that synopsis, Dave. I really appreciate it. Uh, Dan, if you could watch the uh, chat for us, does anybody have a question for either Dave or for Russ? We're very fortunate that we have these direct connections to our um, main, to the main committee and also to the subcommittee. So Dan, do you have any questions you can share with us? Um, yes, we have one here wondering if negotiators can communicate outside of the face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, according to the protocols, and that's sort of, again, um, the rules that we are all, all acting by, there is nothing prohibiting us from um, uh, communicating outside of the face-to-face -face meetings. And in fact, I'm sure I'll see this more at the next set of meetings as we get into the meat of it. Russ is already probably living some of it. Um, you know, that they will, especially when you're talking about proposed language, um, there would be quite a bit of work going on between meetings for um, folks. Yeah, and let me. Um, to, to talk about. Yeah, and let me add to that. Thanks, Dave, that, uh, uh, you, and in fact, they encourage us that we are representative of our groups and I, and, uh, uh, and Dave representing all four-year institutions, that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's pretty good. So they do want us to uh, reach out and do things like this call to alert people and then to get uh, uh, feedback as we, as we go along. The, the one thing they ask us not to do is to uh, put any color in terms of what uh, others on the committees are, are saying or what their, what their uh, um, make opinions about what they're, uh, uh, what they're, give our opinions about uh, what the others are saying. And so I was uh, trying to be careful to put forward that here's what they said um, uh, throughout, through all this. And, and so that uh, I'm sure Dave and I will, will both do that, that we'll be careful about what we say about other the comments from other committee members. Yeah. Exactly. Um, the other thing I would, would note, um, so, so Russ and I are in the room and taking part in the negotiations, which is, um, I mean, I found it fascinating, but there is a live stream um, of both the, the um, primary committee and all the subcommittees, um, which I would encourage you all to, to view, though I've been told that watching the live stream is not as nearly as fascinating as being in the room. Um, but just be aware that they have asked us not to um, use our phones in terms of posting to social media or um, engaging in sort of any sort of outside conversations while, the, while we are actually sitting at the negotiation table. Um, so if someone was hoping that someone might sort of, you know, tw kind of do a live um, Twitter stream or post some during the actual day-to-day -day progress, that activity is is um, not allowed, um, sort of based on the honor code. Just to it, their concern is allowing people to focus on the negotiations rather than what's happening on the phone. Um, but um, feel free to reach out to anybody, negotiators, myself, anybody else at any point in time. Just be aware we may not be able to communicate right back during the negotiations days themselves. Thanks, Dave, for bringing up the live stream, too. I, I found that really uh, helpful to, um, to view and listen to both the regular committee and the subcommittee. Um, last week, they will be meeting again uh, mid-February. And if you go back to the e-newsletter at the beginning of January, there was a URL to find the links to, um, to view the live stream. And I will put that in um, the February newsletter as well so that you'll have the links to be able to find it. And actually, I don't know if you knew this, Dave, but they uh, use YouTube for the subcommittee and that was much more clear um, than the stream that they had used for the regular negotiators. They may have learned from that. So it, it's actually a really good stream um, to listen uh, and hear actually everything that's going on. So uh, you all may appreciate um, having the opportunity to view that. In our subcommittee uh, that we had a few people who asked for an estimated uh, order of 
uh, the day of what was going to be discussed and then uh, uh, proposed times for when something would be discussed. And so, so I'm hoping that that uh, agenda comes out uh, ahead of the next meeting. If, if not, uh, you know, Cheryl can put it out to our folks, but, if, but it's uh, a lot better for you if you do want to see it to know that you could get on at two o'clock Eastern and see the state authorization part if you want to see that rather than sitting there trying to watch it the whole day and then kind of wondering when the next, what the next issue will be because it, it, um, it was, it was not very linear for our group. Right. And, and you know what, it just dawned on me, I'll put it on the home page of the website. That may be easier for everyone rather than trying to find it in an email. So I will put the uh, link to, uh, to get the different uh, streams on the home page of the website. And if we are able to obtain some kind of an agenda for, with timing, I will also post that on the home page of the agenda, uh, excuse me, home page of the website as well. So it'll be easier to find and you can share that with others at your institutions. Are there other questions, Dan, that you see? Yep, here's another one for Dave. Are you allowed to share some of the proposed language or documents with us same day although not will at the table. So it's a follow-up question to the, the question about, about no live social media, but what about afterwards? Um, we, well, we are, because there's nothing in the protocols that would prohibit that. Um, I will say um, that's not always actually really, I understand why you would want that. It's not always actually really easy to do. Um, at least based on my first few hours of experience. Um, and I say that, um, so let me preface all of this uh, by saying that it, in the primary committee, we talked about we will not vote for um, consensus of the issues until probably the very last day. We did spend some time about, because not hearing back from different subcommittees and because of the complexity of the issues and they're all sort of interrelated, we wanted to be able to ensure that we were talking and understood everything and all the multiple impacts before we decided to um, reach formal consensus um, on any of the, the three individual sort of buckets the department is, is broken things into. Consensus, just for anyone who's not aware, means that everyone around the table has to agree. And if we agree, then that's, Primarily, that will be the language that will be used. There are a couple of exceptions that the department wants to keep on hand, mainly regarding if there was some sort of federal legislation change, so then it becomes illegal to do what we had just agreed, stuff like that. But if we reach consensus, then that's the language that will be proposed moving um, and be moved forward. So we won't vote for that for the very last day. Um, so what we're doing right now as we go through things, there's a lot of tweaks, um, but they sort of happen on the fly. And almost as soon as somebody proposes one thing, somebody else proposes something else. Um, so it, it would be really hard to, to give anyone language in the middle of a meeting knowing that it might change five minutes later. Um, I am happy to, to try to do that when we seem to formalize around certain things. Honestly, the, the best thing to do to see the proposed language is to, to look at the negotiated rulemaking page and watch for the updates um, as the department releases them, um, because that's what we'll, we'll actually be discussing um, as, we, as we move forward. Yeah, and what, what we'll do is, especially on the, as the state authorization network here, is that what we'll do is that, as we see uh, proposed state authorization language that we'll send it out to, uh, to this group. And then also, uh, uh, my head is still spinning from the whole thing. I'd hope to have a, a blog written on this by now, but I'm trying to figure out what to, what to, to say. And uh, uh, I, I think I've got a, a path forward for you, but we, we hope to have, uh, Cheryl and I hope to have something out to you uh, uh, late this week or early next week with, uh, uh, some question, giving some of the main issues and some questions that we may have for you about uh, what, what would you like to see regarding this issue and, or that issue or how would you how would you improve professional education <laughs> as an example so things like that. Great, Dan. What other kind of questions do we have? We have one. Um, was there a reason given as to why the committee did not want to add a seat for the attorneys general? 
That's for Dave. Um, that is that is a good question. Uh, so again, I cannot, um, as Russ mentioned a little bit ago, I cannot speak for any of the other negotiators or try to characterize um, any one person's particular stance, why or why not. I will say out of sort of the day and a half, <laughs> probably the most hotly contested issue was whether or not the attorney general's um, should have representation on the main committee. Um, there were a number of people who felt they should be. Um, there was a number of people that felt they should not be. Um, and honestly, after what seemed like hours of conversation, um, the compromise was struck um, that we would give a seat on the main um, accreditation and innovation committee to uh, a SHIO representative um, to represent the states and that um, the attorney general um, seat could be represented in um, the committee uh, focusing on distance education, the one Russ is sitting on. Um, the two, without saying who said exactly what, really the, the two main objections were um, the belief that there would be, uh, if the state attorney general's office was sitting at the table, there was a direct conflict of interest regarding um, some of the organizations represented in terms of um, lawsuits that are currently ongoing. Um, and then secondarily, they felt that in terms of from a consumer protection um, perspective that um, that contingency group was already represented, uh, represented by other members already on the committee. Um, but, but it was a hot, like I said, it was a, a very hotly um, contested and discussed issue over the course of that, the time we met. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Dan, are there any other questions? I'm not seeing any, but um, is there time? I had one came to my mind. Do we have time for that, or are we, are we up against it? So, so this is for Dave as well. Dave, you mentioned all of the time spent uh, setting up the protocols. Is is that the kind of thing that will pay off down the road? Like what? Um, I'm just having a little trouble getting a sense of that. Um, so the, the formal protocols, um, and I have not looked at the negotiated rulemaking page to see if they've been updated by the department yet or not. Um, I asked for a copy on the first day after we agreed to them, um, and they said they would finalize them <coughs> with the, with the full membership of the committee and then redistribute them. Um, I have not received them by email, so I don't know if they've been posted, but those are, um, you can equate them to sort of like the Roberts Rules of Orders that all the members agree to. Um, so it gives us sort of the formal, the formality of these are the rules we will abide by. Um, and it, it discusses everything from, in terms of who's on the committee to the, the formation of subcommittees to how we will dis be making discuss discussion or decisions, um, who is allowed to officially speak or not speak, um, and then how to be um, sort of uh, approved or removed from the committee um, for different things. So, um, you know, this is the first time I've taken part of it. Um, for me, I wasn't exactly sure what they serve, but I, I do, I think they sort of set the ground rules that we're all agreeing by. Um, that doesn't mean I'm happy about all of them. Um, for example, um, there's one that talks about uh, that once consensus has been reached, um, no, no one can sort of speak ill directly about them. Now that's greatly paraphrased. Um, meaning, and what I took it to mean to be is as a negotiator, once we reach consensus, I can't turn around and say, oh my gosh, this is the worst thing in the world because 
as part of the group that reached consensus or agreement on it, I was part of that decision-making process. The department takes it a step further. So in my case, since I represent public four-year institutions, once we reach consensus, technically no four-year public institution is supposed to turn around and then say, these are the worst things ever. Um, there was, I, I brought that up because it's not, I mean, I can't control what everybody in a four-year public institution says around the U.S., but, um, but those are the sort of the, the ground rules we're all supposed to work within. Uh, Dave, uh, let me um, add a little more color to that. I was in the 2014 negotiated rulemaking, and I I think we dispensed with uh, the protocols in under an, an hour at that time, and then certainly then for the subcommittee, we're much more informal, and I think we were able to dispense with it this time, and certainly like half an hour, I think uh, we were able to do it. And I, I think there's some history here in terms of uh, the two rulemakings last year uh, for borrower defense and gainful employment uh, became very, very, very contentious. And I think there was some interest in the, the department changing some of the rules to try to uh, to keep that from being uh, quite so quite so bad. But perhaps some of the ideas uh, um, not everybody agreed with. I guess I'll, I'll put it that way. And so that became so um, those changes uh, from protocols that have been repeated for several years. Uh, I think became hot issues for you, as well as the. Uh, it's not not that common that. Uh, uh, they're trying to see two people on a uh, committee, and so I could see where that took a lot of time, time as well. But I think, I think once you get through it and have the rules of the road, um, that is helpful to the discussions. But it, it was uh, sort of unfortunate that it had to take so long. For that. Yeah, the, within the protocols, the three main issues that took so long to agree to was um, uh, whether the alternate was allowed to speak. Um, in the original protocols, they were not. What we agreed to is that they were, um, with putting some limits around um, sort of how and, and when. Um, obviously, we went back and forth with the membership because we had a lot of discussion about adding members to the committee, but then we, then it was brought up that you can't add members in the committee until the protocols are approved. So we sort of went back and forth a couple of times on that. Um, and then there was also some talk about um, how, in terms of decision making, how things will be grouped together. Um, uh, under what had sort of been released beforehand, it was gonna be all these issues were gonna be in one big bucket. And then, you know, we'd have to agree sort of to an all or nothing. Um, as as Russ just said, based on some previous meetings, they've now subgrouped those into three separate buckets, um, sort of each relating to a subcommittee. Um, and so there was a lot of discussion going back to, okay, what are the groupings? Who can group things? When will we discuss the groupings? And that took a lot of time to, to flesh out. So um, th there was a lot of work and, and questions not necessarily regarding the protocols, but because of the protocols that took us time to work through. Thanks, Dave. Um, Dan, are there any others that you see? That's all I'm seeing right now. Thanks to everybody for who did yeah, appreciate ask. that. Then thanks for watching the chat, Dan. Um, it was something that I, I do want to share is I was really glad that Dave brought up the recordings are actually the, the streaming and I wanted to point out that it is recorded. So if you go to that site, like I said, it, it's posted uh, in the last e-newsletter and I will um, put it on the homepage of the website um, later today and you can watch the recordings from last week should you be interested. There was some very good um, information shared on the subcommittee at the end of Thursday and beginning of Friday, yeah, is that yeah, right? Yeah, the bulk of it is Friday morning, I would yeah, say. Yeah, it was very good discussion. Um, there was a lot, everyone at the table was very engaged, and uh, so it was a very positive thing to listen to the exchange of the folks that are on the subcommittee on that Friday morning. It was teed up on uh, Thursday afternoon and then completed on Friday morning. So I think that's very interesting for those of you that would uh, like to view that. Um, and uh, don't forget Russ mentioned that there will be a blog post uh, end of this week, early next week, that gives you um, a recap 
of what it looked like uh, last week um, in the subcommittee. And uh, Dave, you uh, shared with us a, a really great um, setup of what it looked like for you um, during those the first day and a half of your committee. And then he will be meeting with his committee again after the subcommittee meets in February. So um, the subcommittee will meet first and then the committee will meet. They reverse that order for February. They wanted to get the protocols out of the way in January, but in February, the subcommittee will meet first. So we will keep you up to date on what is happening through this negotiated rulemaking process. Um, so thank you very much to Dave and thank you very much to Russ. Russ, do you have any final words you'd like to share? No, that, that, well, just that, uh, uh, again, do be watching and, and uh, do uh, reach out uh, as, as we go along and it's probably good to uh, put something in the subject line that it is about the negotiated rulemaking so that uh, uh, I can ferret it out from all my other emails. So we, we will be looking for that if you all have any further questions or comments uh, that you would like to see addressed. I'm going to turn this over to Dan in just a second uh, so that I can get back to uh, the CCME meeting. But before I go, um, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. Um, the State Authorization Basics Workshop, uh, Dan will talk more about, but I wanted to point out that there's an early bird registration that was supposed to end this coming Friday. We've chosen to extend it until February 1st. So if you have anybody at your institution who's interested in the workshop, please know that the early bird registration has been extended until February 1st. Um, and then please, uh, Dan can tell you more about the announcements, but please see below that we have added these uh, new events uh, for February, uh, the middle of February. So um, please have a good look at that. Um, Dan will tell you more about it. Um, and I appreciate Dan uh, taking over the rest of the meeting so that I can uh, get back to the CCME. So thank you, Dan. And uh, thank you everybody for being with us today on our first Zoom uh, coordinator call. Have a great day, everyone. Okay, thanks, Cheryl. Thanks, everybody. Um, we're moving on here to the next item on the agenda, something I've learned recently that might help others. Um, I visited a friend recently who is uh, obsessed with model trains, uh, making the tracks and all the different types of engines and everything. And um, I do not share that obsession, but I do share an obsession with the N in the State Authorization Network. So we're trying to think of as many ways to get you guys talking and, and get as many voices into these calls and other areas of SAN programming as we can. So with that, um, I asked for volunteers to see if anybody wanted to share something, anything really that they've learned that might help others. Charlene Lee from East Carolina was going to go first, but she actually got sick today. So we're going to Beverly. Beverly, are you there? Beverly Wade? Yes, I'm here. Okay, take it away. All right. Um, California has uh, passed a law last year called the California Consumer, Consumer Privacy Act. It will go into effect January 1st of 2020. And basically, it is a data protection act. And um, any entity that is doing business in the state of California will be affected by this. And it is geared towards data-driven businesses of all size. So what it does is it provides California consumers with protection. We will have the right to know all data collected by a business on on us, the right to say no to the sale of our information, the right to delete our data. And if some of these are reminding anyone of GDPR, it loosely is similar, but not exactly the same thing. The right to be informed of what categories of data will be collected before, I'm sorry, about you prior to its collection and to be informed of changes to how this information is collected, the right to know the categories of third parties with whom your data is shared, the right to know the category of sources of information from whom your data was acquired, and the right to know the business or commercial purpose of collecting your information. My institution is currently in the process of figuring out how this will affect our, some of our big business practices, but one of the things that I'm thinking of just off the top of my head is as we collect data for 
lists, whether it's grad school or undergrad for student lists. And I wanted to make sure that I let the rest of the network know that you may want to check your third party um, vendor contracts to ensure that they are aware of this upcoming um, Privacy Act and that they are at least in the process of trying to get in compliance with it because, um, like I said, it goes into effect January 1st of 2020. Thanks, Beverly. Is, is it your understanding then that, in, that um, student, um, universities who have students enrolling from California, distance or otherwise, would be, would be subject to this? Um, that's my understanding right now. How it is is that it's going to be enforced by the Attorney General and um, just understanding California law, I don't see them uh, making any kind of differentiation. But when they're saying that it is applies to all entities doing business in California, I, yeah, I'm taking them seriously on that, that that's exactly what it means. Okay, thanks. Uh -huh. um, does anybody have any questions for Beverly on this one? Not seeing, not seeing any in the um, chat box right now, but that is a good, uh, a good heads up. Um, and a good, um, also a good reminder that um, our webinar on February 13th on this yes. topic, you can read about that at the bottom of the agenda. Um, so we are getting towards the end here. This state authorization back to basics workshop we are trying doing something new this year, which is a any part, any participant there can take an assessment at the end to receive a credential. Uh, this is uh, WCET SANS first dipping our dipping our toe into the pool of badging, which we're seeing all the all the cool kids are doing nowadays. A number of number of areas. So we're working on questions right now. The way it would work is for those of you who've gone to a basics workshop before or, or an advanced or in advance for that matter, but uh, at the end of the, the, the actual test you would take when you get back to campus. So you would learn, um, learn everything you can while you're there and you get back to campus, you'll have a chance to go online and take an online assessment. And it will be then, you will be then graded and um, you will, if you pass, you will get a wonderful um, new credential, which um, we will then see what, um, what that does in terms of, of, of how, how interested people are um, and um, so so you have a chance if you go to this first basics workshop to be a, one of the beta testers if you will of our new of our first foray into the, to the world of badging so anyways I encourage anybody to uh, attend this who is uh, wants to go to a basics workshop um, we are we're working on the curriculum um, day and night over here so um, I would encourage that and also remind, um, remind you as Cheryl does to take a look at the announcements at the bottom uh, for the upcoming programming open forum and data protection webinar. Um, do we have any questions from anyone about anything? I don't see anything. So, um, oh, we do have one question here for Beverly. Would you mind sharing um, a link or a copy of the new act. I will. Not a problem. <laughs> okay. I'm a little slow on the um, take, but yes, no, I will um, put it in the chat box, but I can send it to you as well. So you can send it out to everyone. Yeah. Why don't you do that? Why don't you do okay. that? Um, we'll send it out in the next mailing. And um, okay. yes, the, the mute unmute quick draw is, is one of the skills of office workers these days. Okay. So, um, Seeing nothing else, thank you all for your time, and I uh, look forward to next time, um, next time we talk. Thank you.